So, Neil, I, I'm, I have always tried to understand Trump through the patterns. And my, my sort of take on him after six years of covering now is that they're not new moves, they're just new grifts. And so to me, what I saw in some of the documents that are cited is he lied to his accountant, who then would vouch for valuations the same way he lied to Christina Robb about the Mar-a-Lago classified documents. The pattern is always the same. This was another exhibit of that pattern. 100% Nicole. So this new lawsuit is basically alleging that Donald Trump ignored outside experts and advice, that he inflated his personal value, and he roped his family and friends into supporting the fraud. And, you know, say what you will, Donald Trump ran his business the way he ran the country. And you're absolutely right. It's pattern after pattern. Now, to be sure, this is a civil lawsuit. So if it's successful, as I suspect it will be, it won't land Donald Trump in prison. There are criminal implications that we can talk about in a minute. But I think Tom Winter is exactly right to say that this really does put a huge financial, it puts him at huge financial risk with a lifetime ban on uh, the Trump organization, loans being called and all sorts of things. I guess on the other hand, the New York Attorney General is also seeking to bar the Trump family from acquiring real estate for the next five years. Um, and given Trump's average return on investment, she might be doing him a favor. I don't know. Um, but, uh, um, but you know, to me, what really stood out is the devastating range in this complaint. 200 examples, over 222 pages. And it feels ironclad. I mean, remember that Alan Weisselberg, who was Trump's CFO, has already pled guilty to these, uh, to these offenses, 15 different felonies he pled to. 15 felonies, and somehow I don't think that Alan Weisselberg is the one who committed the most crimes here. So a former prosecutor described the evidence that she's marshaled to me as, as being presented in, quote, mind-numbing detail. And he said that the conduct spans 10 years and, and a pattern that we've been talking about over valuations that is kind of undeniable. And I, I wonder, I want to turn to what the criminal investigation would look like. Um, SDNY obviously had access to Michael Cohen, but the document production and, and what is in her complaint, I don't see Michael Cohen's name anywhere. I mean, clearly, if, if he was the, the match that started this, what has been filled out is, is, you know, hundreds of pages now of evidence based on documents that are indisputable. I mean, already on the public docket are 10 years of the former president's personal financial statements or at least his presentation of his wealth. And when you start to go through, and, and I'm there with Su Suzanne, I mean, it's going to be another, you know, a day or two, I think, of reading through this thing before it, it all sinks in. You see email exchanges. I mean, paragraph to paragraph, point to point, where they're pointing out, okay, this person says to do this, this person says to do that. So the... The civil complaint, if it's to be believed, is built on top of kind of real-time contemporaneous communications and notes about exactly what the business was doing or trying to do at the moment it was trying to do that. Are these email messages new? Are they new types of evidence that they can hand over to the Southern District or the IRS Criminal Division? And if so, um, is it going to be just a strict, you know, hey, here you go and hand it over to them? Or is it going to be the type of thing where they say, you know, here's our roadmap and you guys can, you know, go with your own federal grand jury subpoenas? So there's a, probably a couple of different ways that they could go with it. But it certainly would allow them the past to, to move forward uh, if there's and this is the big, you know, kind of the big turning point here. One, does it violate federal law in statute? Uh, that's more of a Neil question than a Tom question. And then the second thing is, you know, this is a civil case versus a criminal case, and the bar is higher in a criminal case. That's just, that's just known, and I know you know that. So when you look at this in totality, are they going to be able to tie that all together? I, I still think, though, the immediate threat for the president, who's facing an ongoing criminal investigation involving classified documents that we've talked about a lot this week, um, the idea and prospect of him losing his business, his legacy, his kids' business, their legacy, I think compounded with these other investigations, even if his 
uh, his political funds are helping to support that defense effort, right. um, still is really starting to become an anvil over him uh, as far as moving forward and, and maybe his calculus. Then that becomes a political calculus. That's much more your world than mine. No, uh, but, it's, but, but it, they're all this. I mean, to your point, they're, they're totally, you, you can't separate one from the other because right. the fervor on the politics, the taking on the QAnon people is about losing his legacy and his business and his family fortune. Yeah, I mean, I think he's starting to look at some chips that are pretty well stacked against him. He got no favors in front of the special master yesterday. And so he's looking at a situation where uh, he's fighting a lot of legal battles on all fronts. I know people say, well, you guys have been talking about investigations for years. You're on. You're talking about every single development. First things first, we talk about in developments involving the current or former president of the United States because those are huge developments. And so the reporting that David's done, Suzanne's done, has been incredibly important over the years just to understand the person who was at the time running or the president of the United States. Number two, no guarantees are made as far as any sort of investigations bearing fruit from an indictment or a civil standpoint. Analysts are free to make those uh, make those judgments. That's what they're paid to do. They have the expertise to do it. Finally, when you look at all of these investigations now that we have been talking about, we've been talking about this one today in particular for years, they're all starting to come to a point and they're all starting to come to a conclusion and they're not concluding with a we can't really bring a case. They're not concluding with a, we're not going to sue. They're concluding with, we're suing. They're concluding with, mm -hmm. we're getting a search warrant for the president's, yeah. former president's residence. So these, all these things are starting to come together in a way that points for significant legal, legal trouble on the horizon, not just political trouble because, oh, special counsel Mueller brought somebody else in today to talk to. No, no, no. He's bringing in people or these people are bringing in people and are actually making cases directly against the now former president of the United States. I think that's a point that shouldn't be lost in all this. I mean, it's, and it's a pretty powerful point coming from you, Tom. Under. I know you have to go. I know you develop a Twitch if you have to sit on TV and not dive into the documents themselves. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to let you go. But just, just one more. I mean, the, what, what has changed, though, is the evidence and the access to the evidence. And this case is right. all on paper. This is all about what she saw. It's about, you know, I, and I just want to put up one be before you go because it's a perfect example. This is something that everyone can understand as illegal, cheating, and fraudulent. This is Tish James on how we lied about how much his apartment was worth. Mr. Trump represented that his apartment spanned more than 30,000 square feet, which was the basis for valuing the apartment. In reality, the apartment had an area of less than 11,000 square feet, something that Mr. Trump was well aware of. And based on that inflated square footage, the value of the apartment in 2015 and 2016 was $327 million. To this date, no apartment in New York City has ever sold for close to that amount, tripling the size of the apartment for purposes of the valuation was intentional and deliberate fraud, not an honest mistake. And then we've got um, from the lawsuit itself. Um, this is the power, I guess, of what you're describing, the legal process sort of combing through its witnesses, including Donald Trump. So when asked about the scheme she just described there, he invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege. The question, you are aware that from 2012 through 2016, the value of your triplex apartment in Trump Tower was calculated by multiplying 30,000 square feet times the price per square foot. Is that right? Same answer. He takes the fifth. And you personally directed the use of 30,000 square feet in valuing your apartment for the statement of financial condition. Same answer. He takes the fifth. The 30,000 square foot figure is false. Is that right? Same answer. When you directed the use of that square footage to value your triplex, you knew that the 30,000 square foot figure was false. Takes the fifth. So she, she's got the lie. She's got Trump. Well, and she also has a deposition, and that deposition and those comments, if this does go to a jury trial, is something that is admissible. So what you just did is presumably what a prosecutor might do in a year, two years' time from now in presenting this going forward. This is not a case based on what we've been told today by the attorney general. We're relying on Michael Cohen's statement, Stormy Daniels' statement. Anybody's statement. We're relying on, we have the president actually answering questions in front of a live questioner, not somebody who submitted him written questions. And we have documents, financials, and math that's occurring here. Undoubtedly, the Trump side, and they already are, are tweeting about it, 
questioning he the math here. He doesn't get to here. tweet. They're doing something that's a, else. That, that's a good point. Social. His his uh, uh, his his children are tweeting about this. Mm. But when you look at this, it is a very different case than some of the actions that have been brought before or some of the investigations that have been brought before. Tom Winter, thank you so much for your reporting. You, you are now free to go report. <laughs> um, I want to play for you something, David Farenthold, that caught my attention. It's a question from Josh Gerstein to Attorney General Tish James. Do they just not check anything that people tell them, or they presumed it was true, or did they have hints that these things were not true, that they were being told? And what does it tell you about those institutions that they would take his word for it? So let me just say, with respect to Mazars, Mazars, Mazars indicated on the statement of financial condition that they did not certify and they did not audit these statements. Um, that does not absolve Mr. Trump of submitting um, accurate information. Two, with respect to Cushman Wakefield, there is an ongoing investigation into Cushman Wakefield. Um, and then uh, lastly, with respect to Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank, uh, you, we're in conversations with Deutsche Bank. They have been cooperating with our office. I mean, what she pulls the curtain back on, David Farenthold, is a very far-ranging investigation that has checked all the boxes of any potential participants in the fraud. Yeah, and this is important here. One of the the questions that, they, that they're going to have to answer in this case is, you know, well, this is real estate. Everybody fudges the numbers. Everybody says their properties are the greatest. So how do you draw a line that separates just sort of normal puffery from fraud? And I think the way they're going to try to do it is by showing that, look, they did talk to experts. They did talk to appraisers. They talked to people, you know, they had access to real people who saw this from an objective point of view and told them their numbers were totally wrong, not even in the same ballpark. And then knowing the right answer or knowing the, the range of the right answer they chose to ignore it. I think that will go towards showing the kind of intent they would need to prove to show that this was not just an honest mistake or sort of normal real estate flim flam, but something far beyond that that moved into the realm of fraud.